I don't count. Yeah. That sounds like a huge waste of time. <laughs> it is, but it's kind of compulsory if you want to do your love of music. Wait, Ooh. is it you? Yeah. Yeah. Is that a battery? I don't know how to I don't know how to charge it. Can we do some math on the physics of this thing? Mm. It's not physics, it's just water because... Um, What's well, it's good that you're curious. Why I have to I make me do the math yeah. on it? <laughs> like, why does sometimes it's really slow? It's uh, it takes a good quick up there. They're, they're smart one. But okay, like, so the first problem we're talking boom, about. Boom, then it goes fast, and then it now it's like. <coughs> it goes really fast, now it's slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking about, mm -hmm. If that's a bit quick here, you can turn around. Everything's very. So the question says m plus n divides oh, mn, right? Yes. If this happens. Then m plus n is less than or equal to n squared. Yeah, but I propose you can conclude that m plus n is divides n squared. Oh. Okay. So m, n, m and m both positive. It tells yeah. greater than zero integers. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I don't know. Like I want, I want to try some of these things because they are related to the theory we actually learned. Okay. <laughs> So, if you don't use it, it means you're basically working at a disadvantage. Um, you know, it's one of the kind of things we're thinking about. Remember when you have, like, if D divides... AB. AB, right? And D has GCD... CCD1. One, one, yeah, right? Divide and three. D divides B, yeah? yeah. So then, and then obviously, means, if it's prime, it just divides A or B, yeah? yeah. Because A, it, since... A does not contribute any factors to the visibility. Yeah. <coughs> so one of the things that was kind of cool when you think about it, right? Like if D divides M plus N, right? Yes. <coughs> and so let's see, how do you do something like this? So maybe you can make D the GCD of M plus N and MN, right? Yeah. Then... Then D divides um, MN, right? Yeah. Mm. Um, let me say this. Because the GCD has to be at least M plus N. Oh, oh what was I saying? Oh, what was I saying? Sorry, I was saying, I was saying something much simpler. Maybe we can assume that. Um, okay, let's assume something like the GCD of M and N is one, yeah? Okay. How? Why can we assume that? Hmm? We, we might not be able to assume that. Oh, okay. right? So I'm just playing with the oh, problem. Oh, playing with a simpler problem. Yeah. So you can assume that, say, if, if, if you want to assume, like, the GCD is one, right? Yes. Um, you can have, like, for example, and you have some other thing, like D, dividing M plus N, right? Yeah? Yeah. And then D divides M N. Yeah? Um, Is that good charging Okay. But since the GCD of, um, let's see. M and N are one. M and N is one. I think, I don't know, it's been a while since I did this, but like the GCD of D and M should be one. Is that right? Why? What was I saying? Um, no, it's not. It might not, yeah? I don't, I don't know. What was I saying? So D divides M plus N. Yes. And D divides M and N. So uh, if this is M and N can no common factors. Can no common factors. Then one of them, at least one, uh, one of them will share factors with D. Hmm. And let's say D completely divides M or N. Yeah, I think that's what I was trying to conclude. So I, I think... Because M plus N, if M and N have no factors, that means M plus N does not divide M, neither M or, nor N. Oh, uh, no, no, because no, if, um, because if, N, like, D must have, like, D has to either only divides, like, M or only divides N or, like, share, like, 
some factors between those. Mm-hmm. And if it shares the fact, like, <clears throat> if it shares a group of factors between those, then, um, like, say, like, if the different, like, say, um, Wait, are they? Everyone, yeah. Like, two and three, like, then those like, would be order shared order, with that, right? Yeah, it has to be shared. Just and then, with, well, then if that's shared, then everything then GCD would not be one. one. Yes. Yeah. But is there, is so that means we have the, liquid. Liquid. Hmm. I mean, it's water Yeah, so if you let like, let's see. Is there so an error? The D and M have GCD1. Oh, okay. Except for these, there's no error. Oh, okay. Well, one of that's them has GCD1. Like, they both have GCD1, basically. Yeah, that's it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I guess if you look at the part that divides m, right? Yeah. That part also divides m plus n, right? Yeah. So that part should also divide n. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So if you look at like a common factor between d and m, yeah. So let e equal to gcd of um, d and m, yeah. So E divides M plus N, and E divides M, right? Yeah. So therefore, E divides N, yeah? E divides N, oh. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because if, if any time it divides something, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it divides something else, it divides any linear combination. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it yeah, divides yeah. this minus that, yeah? Yeah. What do you mean? If it divides something? So if it divides M plus N, yes. yeah. and it divides M, it divides m plus n minus m. Uh, but then that just means... Because these are multiples of e and these uh, are multiples okay. of e, so you can do addition or subtraction with multiples of e, right? So, yeah. Oh, yeah. so then e divides n. Uh, right? means if, if plus n does not change its divisibility, then that means m must be divisible by itself. Yes, that makes sense. So and then if e divides n and m, since so the GCD was 1, then e must be 1. GCD, yeah, e is 1, so it doesn't matter. So that means GC. Oh, so that means GCD of the other one. Right. So then D must divide n. Yeah. Okay. But actually, by the same reasoning, you know, the GCD of D and n is one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the D so must actually, divide m, and D so that means, and that's a contradiction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it shows stuff is equal to one. You yeah? know. Yeah. So it's a, except for it's equal to which is of course it can't be. Yeah. So if GCD of well, this is one and that is one, then they could all be one, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. M and n could all. all or D could be one. So, yeah. But since we know M plus N divides M N, right? Yeah. Then that would mean like M N is one. Two divides into one. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, but it's basically like if not a contradiction, it trivializes everything. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is a good observation, and then something related. So I'm put. I'm putting this up. These are the first things I thought of because they're the last things we did in the theory, right? And they're related to the visibility. So another thing was um, just actually the actually the, the, the even more simple version of that is when you have a prime that divides AB, right? P either divides A or P divides B, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense? So if you think about it, you have a prime that divides M plus N, right? Yeah. Yeah? And so therefore, the prime must divide M, N, right? By the assumption of the question, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So that means P must divide M, right? Or P divides N. Yeah? If it's prime. Okay. M and N might not be prime. How much did this cost? M and N might... Oh, okay. Prime meaning it only has one factor. One prime factor. So, yes. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. What are we talking about? Yeah. Uh, oh, nothing yeah. like... Just talking it's about the, the line. Bro. Okay, so... Basically, can you see the same conclusion as the kind of above argument? Actually, P is that, that M and P must divide both P, M and N, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So P divides M and P divides N, right? Because if it divided M, by the same argument, it has to divide M plus M minus M, right? Yeah, yeah. so that means it must divide M. It divides both, right? What? So it actually, I was trying to figure it out. So if it divides both, then it's kind of like M on P plus N on P. Right, and then you're trying to replace it by M N on P, right? Yeah. But okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So actually, 
it's funny, this observation is enough to actually solve the problem, right? Oh, oh, um, yeah. But so at that point, I, I was actually still playing around with it so much, I didn't even notice. Okay? <laughs> so I just left it like that. And then I was looking for ways, you know, I just kept playing. I was looking for ways you could generate. I was looking for what kind of numbers. So this is what we were doing with you and Kavan. Yeah. What kind of numbers you can actually have where the sum divides the product. <laughs> And then we came up with a whole bunch of ways of doing oh, that. Actually, so wait, basically, is there not a hard and fast rule for sum dividing products? I think this is basically, I haven't verified it, but it's kind of like you look at the sum, right? Yeah. Does it divide the product? Okay. If it does, you're done, right? Yeah. But if it doesn't, then you can take the part that doesn't, right? Yeah. So the non, like you divide by the GCD or something, right? Yeah. And then you just times that by M and N. Oh. So like you take like, M prime plus N prime, yeah? Okay. And the question is, does it divide M prime, M prime, yeah? Yes. So if the answer is no, right, then you just look at by how they differ. So like M prime plus N prime, um, M prime, M prime, the GCD, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Whatever that is, let's say call that D, yeah? Yeah. Maybe separately, there's gonna get some D's confused. Um, and so that part's already dividing, so it's the other part that you need, right? So you need M prime. Wait, what am I saying here? What the hell is M prime? M prime, just any numbers at all, any oh, positive yeah. numbers at all. Any number, yeah. Yeah. So M prime plus M prime. Um, so that part of it, what am I doing? That part of it already divided, the D already divides the MN prime, right? Yeah. So it's it's just the other part that needs to divide, yeah? Uh, yeah. So it's the M prime plus M prime on D. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's missing, right? Yeah. So you can actually just times this, like you let that equal K, right? Yeah. And then set M equal K M prime. N equals K N prime. Right. Oh. And then that generates a whole bunch of things that divide the product. Because now when you add, when you add them, there's a common factor of k, right? Right. Yeah. And when you times them, there's that k, right? Yeah. So when you add them, there's a one factor of k. When you times them, there's two, right? Yeah. So that'll take care of not only this factor of k, but the factor of k that comes from this. Does that make sense? Oh. oh. So like now we just have to check that M plus N divides M N, yeah? Which is just saying that K M prime plus M prime divides K squared M prime M prime, right? Yeah. And then, and then that obviously the K cancels. Yeah, and since GCB is... We define K to be like that. Yeah, K is definitely a factor yeah. of M. So this was that first example I showed. You remember you, you guys weren't convinced that five and three could be made into something? It was like five plus three, right? That's eight. It doesn't divide into 15, right? But you just times them both by eight. Oh. And that divides into whatever it is. Okay. case. So, um, that's eight squared times. That's eight. That's eight squared. Squared, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I get yeah. So while cool, it, it's kind yeah, of a little yeah. bit of a tangent now. Okay, but can you see, like, and this is maybe a good way for you guys to learn some induction too, okay? So, if there's an uh, okay. returning to the problem now. <laughs> so, wait, is that induction hypothesis that if anything div doesn't divide, you can always times it by A so it divides, so it times it by the number so it divides? Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure, like, I didn't actually look into this any further, but I'm pretty sure this is, like, one of the ways to generate a lot of, if not all of the way the things that satisfy this, okay? Oh, yeah. Um, because it's pretty natural, right? Mm. I mean, you're just getting the part that you don't have. Maybe you guys can investigate that if you want. I don't like saying that because I think I know the outcome. Some things are predictable. Yes. What are we using for our also? Even without batteries, it distracts you. Well, this is tracks you without battery. <laughs> I just destroyed it. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. It's better in a better place now. One day we'll end up in the recycling centers. No, I'll keep it for a while. Nah, bro. Okay, so can you see how this actually solves the problem? Uh, 
how M plus N must be. Oh, yeah, sure. Huh? P will divide M and P must also divide N. Yeah, so basically the conclusion is P divides N, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so it, it's simultaneous. So the reason why I didn't think it solved the problem straight away, right, is because the argument doesn't generalize. Well, it doesn't generalize in like the stupid way to P squared, okay? You know what I mean? Like, imagine if you did P squared, right? So I was hoping that if you did P squared, you could just replace. M and N by M on P and P N on P. And then you get the P whole P squared divides N, right? Okay, yeah. But you can't, I right? Don't. You know oh. why? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, yeah. so if you have like P squared divides M plus N, right? Yep. P squared divides M N, yeah? Yep. So as a consequence of this argument, P divides N, right? Mm. And M, because P squared is more than P, yeah? Yeah. And P divides N, yeah? Yeah. So in some sense, you have P divides M on P plus N on P, right? Um, yeah. Yeah? Sure. But you don't have P, you, so this is what you don't have. Because you lose two P's here, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah? okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did he leave because he didn't understand? Or does he really need a toilet? Oh, yeah. <coughs> Rowling doesn't understand this because, like, I don't, I can't, I still can't see what how this will solve the problem. Really? Well, it's okay, but like, is it pessimism or is it like, like, you don't actually have to see the final QED, right? Can you see how this is in the same direction as the problem? Well, M plus N less than <laughs> no, that's pessimism. I know you well enough. That's uh, pessimism. M plus n is less, you can't prove M plus n less than n squared, well, n squared has to be less than p squared. Trademark pessimism. N squared has to, uh, well, n squared has to be greater than p squared, so if you can show M and n less than p squared, then you can show hmm. M yeah. less than n squared. Yeah, so I think uh, you're getting onto the storyline. So you're just like half a step ahead of me here, okay? So I think one interesting realization. Now, okay, uh, now I actually get it. <laughs> It takes a little he explained bit of... to himself. Yeah, <laughs> that's I like smart students. I have to explain to myself to get it. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. That's very good. So basically, see, like this doesn't quite work, right? Because there's not enough p's left here. Yeah. Yeah. But if you have p cubed, right? Oh. Okay. Um. Let's see. If you have p cubed, so you can still like so p cubed, you would get one of the p's, and it would divide this, right? Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But now you have one left over, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then it has to divide one of them. Therefore, yeah. it has to divide both of them, right? Yeah. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. Wait, so then you have oh, n yeah, on yeah, yeah. p squared now, n on p squared, right? Wait, it, what what? Does it have to Wait, it's the same happened? reasoning, oh. right? Uh, so imagine there's just a p here. Yeah. Yeah. If it divides one of them and it divides the sum, oh, okay, yeah, it has yeah. to divide the other yeah. one. Yeah. The right is p squared divided. Oh, okay, you missed it, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's what happens when you just leave randomly. Just, just watch live stream. No, no, okay, so what, what we were saying is... We, we, okay, yeah. do you mind if I repeat it for him? Yeah. Okay, you can just say sorry to everyone later. Yeah, okay. I'll just, just everyone watch the live stream. You oh, I'll give everyone... I want to look at my magic card. Oh, say sorry. <laughs> All right, okay, listen, listen up. Okay, so we were saying that this doesn't get anywhere anymore. You're not even listening. <laughs> I thought you It was this guy's fault. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, it, it, it's both your fault. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so we were saying P divides M on P plus N on P, right? Yeah. So we're saying what happens if P squared does this, yeah? But how do you prove that P squared? What? You can't. But we're assuming P squared. Oh, okay. Does. But the thing so is, if you, can, if you can prove any power of P, right, that solves the problem. Oh, do you agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, maybe. maybe I don't know if I should mention that or you should realize that yourself. But um because there's only so many things in M plus N, right? And then it becomes M plus N. Because <laughs> yeah. M plus N can be factorized in powers of prime. Yeah, yeah? there's not gonna be that many. Yeah, okay. So we don't even know what P is, right? Right? So then it could have been any of the primes in there. Okay, so if we try squared, right? Yeah. You get one of the P's in there, so you can conclude that 
m has a p in it, n has a p in it, right? And since it was squared, there's one more p to divide this, yeah? yeah? But the problem is it's squared, there's, there's not enough p's left to divide this, right? Because it's only squared, okay? There's no more p's left when you divide by p twice, right? Okay, so I was saying, what happens if you change it to cubed, right? If you change it to cubed, see? You get p squared divides this now, right? Yeah? Yeah. But now you do have a p left over, right? Yes? Yes. You do have a p left over, and because p has to divide one of these two things, right? It has to divide both of those things because it divides the sum. It's the same argument as before. You know what I'm talking about? I'm saying P divides M on P or P divides N on P, right? Uh -huh. And we know that P divides M on P plus N on P. Yeah, so okay. N on P must be also a multiple. Yeah, P. so therefore if it divides M on P. We never said M was greater than P squared. Because it divides it, so we be, it's assumed. Yeah. So what are you asking? Oh, yeah, no, no. It's assumed that M is, has yeah, to be greater it. than P squared. Oh, it's not actually assumed. So I guess it's kind of interesting. So it, it divides it, so you can conclude that it is, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so therefore, it, it all becomes an M, yeah? Mm. Okay. And then you can actually, there's actually a P squared in both of these, right? P squared here, right? Yeah. But then there's no more P's left because you only have three to begin with and you just got four. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is kind of when you start to know this, this is like, Good it's enough. all happening, yeah? Yeah. And then if you were like, so I think I made a pretty stupid mistake by thinking that I forgot what the actual question was because sometimes uh, you forget the question. What? <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah, but then when I realized what the question was, I was like, oh my gosh, Same thing, pretty much. I solved the problem. So, so because we don't need to let it, we don't need it to, because I was trying to get it to divide n, right? Yeah. It's divide n squared. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So when you put n squared, you automatically get a ton more primes. Oh. Yeah? So, like, can you see? Like, we showed that p squared divides n, right? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. That shows that p to the 4 divides, divides n squared, squared yeah. right? So and that's that. Peter, then the point is, p to the four is bigger than p cubed. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So you just need the power of p that divides n squared to be at least as big as the power of p that you assume divided the m plus n, right? Oh, Does that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So that's going to be the statement. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, like I'm explaining the process. The actual proof could be pretty elegant if you think about it. Oh so, yeah. I mean, the process to get to the r, right? divides n plus n, right? Then p to the r divides n squared. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of the statement we're going for then. Mm. Seems and, legit. Yes. And that, that proves the statement, doesn't it? Because, oh, yeah. because then the conclusion is n plus n divides n squared, right? Yeah. Because every prime power factor of n plus n will then divide n squared, right? Oh, okay. Um, seems legit. Seems, but what about other okay. prime factors? Well, only, yeah, you're only accounting for one prime factor. Yeah, I guess, what, what happens if, what do you mean? Uh, like if n plus n is p oh, to the r uh, times. He so could be any of the prime factors. Like, it just, like, if you do one, then you don't screw all the, like, if you generalize the... It's because arbitrary, right? You never assume which prime factor yeah, it was. Yeah. It's just, p is so just, it's all of them. So it has to be all of them, right? What about multiple different prime factors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, what you do like one? For example, it's three to the four plus five times five to the five squared. Yeah, yeah so you let like p be three. Yeah. You let p be three, and then therefore n squared is divisible by three to the four, yeah? And then you let p be five. Therefore n squared will be divisible by five squared. Cause so therefore, question. therefore and if it's divisible by two prime powers, it's also divisible by the product, right? Yeah. yeah. That's kind of like it's the L C M it's like it's only a, a bit of time to wrap around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like because it, because you are only writing one prime factor, but there in reality right. there can be multiple. It's, it's, it's like it's sufficient to show for one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because if you show for one, yeah. So you, you take like two. You said two to the four. Three to the four squared, times right? five squared. It doesn't matter. 
Yeah? Yeah. So then you just let P equals 2, right? Yes. And R equals 4. Yeah? So then 2 to the 4 divides N squared. Yeah? Yeah. And then you let P equals 5. five. R equals 2. Yeah. And then, and then five, 5 squared square divides N squared. And if 5 squared and 2 to the 4 divide N squared, then since they're co-prime, yeah, then oh, yes. the LCM divide. Yes, I get it now. Because it does, you can just repeat it for any number of times. Because every number has to be a factor of a, a, a finite, finite number, number. A of finite number of prime powers. Yeah. yeah. A unique factor. That's a theorem we explicitly yes. proved, right? Yeah. So actually, the, the nice thing about this question is we're answering it in terms of a proof stated so, entirely in concepts that we've explicitly Proof yeah. in this course. Yeah. So yeah. we can that's assume knowledge in these. Well, well, it's assumed knowledge for us, but conveniently, it also seems to be yeah. assume assume knowledge to, yeah. for the AIMO yeah. and like well, we, well, yeah. yeah. And if and if your argument turns out to be like this, then it probably is very significant evidence that the assumed knowledge involves these yeah. things. Yeah. So the actual proof could be really elegant, like a to the a to the a one plus b times if a to the a one plus p to the a one times p two to the a two times b three to the a three, yeah. like divide them in, then p yeah. p and then that same sequence must divide n squared, mm. and then so I guess yeah. So there's an interesting issue you brought up. So I guess it's the confidence which which you can expect the marker to read the statement, it suffices to show that yeah, yeah, yeah. PR <laughs> divides M plus N implies P to the R divides N squared. And I think in these kind of contests, I mean, if I was marking it, I'd be like, oh, yes, it certainly does. It basically depends on if they see that it suffices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that if they think you see that it suffices. <laughs> yeah? What? I don't if get that, that makes any sense. I didn't, that if you say it and they get it, uh, I yeah. this it's like almost like uh, if they get it, they think that you got it. Like, yeah. Whereas some other know. situations, where it's like you say it, they're just like, ooh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. yeah. Because they don't see it straight away, and then it's like, oh, how do you how do you see it straight away? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? But you didn't see it straight away because you spent a while. Should I look up the solution? The solution is like got to be right here. Yeah, yeah two, what you, two, two seconds. seconds. Yeah. It's like a computer. Is there a computer? Oh. Or mine. Mine, you want to do the TOT. Yes, so. Then why is there gold stuff? Oh, because this proof seems legit. That's why Let's go. Seems legit. Next yeah. proof. Wow, it's so cool. Well, we're not done yet. Well, is this true? Yeah, it's really cool. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Huh? Right. You have to prove it. Is it clear that we did it for R equals 1 already, yeah? Yes. Mm. We did it with R equals 1, it actually divides N, not just. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Well, we so R equals 1 is done, yeah? No, we have to or do, do you want it. me to do it again? Oh, um, yes, yeah, so R equals 1 is done. Yeah. He wants me to do it again. But why do you have to prove R, R for any for a higher number of powers? Why can't you just say oh, it's right. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 5 times 5 times 5? Because it might not necessarily Because they're not co-prime, right? Oh, okay, so they're... Yeah? Also. If so the prime it power is co-prime with other prime powers, but not with other the same prime powers, yeah. So that's what that was the whole point, right? We couldn't do it for p squared, is what stopped oh, okay. us before, right? Wait, let's just do it for like p equals r equals one, like. Okay, let's do it for r equals one, yeah. So p divides m plus n, yeah. And therefore p divides m n by assumption of the problem, yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Then p divides m or p divide. Let's say p divides m because otherwise we're done, right? What do you mean p plus p divides m n by assumption of the because the assumption oh, okay. m plus n okay. divides mn, yeah? That's what you mean. Yeah. And therefore, p also divides into n. So from these two things, you get that p divides n, right? Yeah. Because p divides m plus n minus m, yeah? Which means a p squared divides m. this is a multiple of p minus a multiple of p, yeah? That's the point. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah? So, so this means p and divides course, m, yeah? You don't need to prove why, why p divides yeah. m. Okay, well, and then therefore p divides n squared, yeah? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Wait, how do you make sure P divides M? Oh, right. It, cause it has to do one of them. Oh, okay. M cool. N, and if it's N, we're done. If it's N, then we go straight to here, yeah? Yes. You agree? Hmm. Okay, so P divides M plus M, that's true. But how. 
and p divides n squared, but that does not necessarily mean that m plus n divides n squared. Hmm? Is it? No. Well, no, it doesn't. You have to do. Yeah. No, yeah. but but but, all, but when you show the whole result, right? Yeah. M plus n will be equal Some to the product down. of the powers of primes. Yeah. And each of them will divide n squared. So therefore, when you put them together, that's the m plus n that divides n squared. Oh yeah. Okay, yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Seems legit. Yeah. That makes yeah. No, um, it doesn't seem legit. It is legit. Yes, it is legit. No, he's just being cautious, which is fine. I mean, a lot of things I thought seemed legit before were legit, but weren't for the reasons I thought they were <laughs> legit for, yeah? yeah. <clears throat> Next. Like, implicit differentiation. Anyways. <laughs> so, you know... Okay. You want to do this for induction? Okay. Yeah. Induction. Okay. So let's say like you have P to the K. So assume, assume P to the K... Divides, divides m plus n, n and implies p to the k divides n squared. Yeah, that's yeah. the assumption. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So if you don't know induction, here's a good time to learn it. Then you have to show p to the k plus one, and we have to say, well, we don't have to say it, but maybe this is k is greater than or equal to one. Yeah. Okay, it's greater than equal to one. It's it, it, it k is whatever values that like your base k applies to, right? Yeah. So one is the lower, so you say greater than one. And you have to show that p k plus one divided n plus n implies that p to the k plus one divides n squared. Yeah. yeah. So if it's for, for, yeah, for like for you, it's not like an ideas thing. It's more like a writing out thing, yeah. I guess. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah. Not really, but. Writing out no, it's point. true, and yeah, I mean, this is kind of like you know, sometimes it's, you can think of it as simplifying thinking, but really, your thinking might also be simpler if people viewed it as like directly mind to mind link. <laughs> but if they have to link through this, then this probably looks the simplest, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, what were we saying? So, we're going to show that, right? So, if you show an implication, you assume this, and then you try to get that, right? So, if this is true. Well, David's already bored because this is already trivial now, right? Is it trivial? Not really. Okay. But awesome. It's very, you know, ASSEM, yeah. Wait, yeah. why are you still assuming stuff? Oh, because yeah. when, you're, when, you're, when, you're, when you're proving... Okay, in induction, you assume something. Yes, but now you're assuming something. So induction is you're proving an implication, right? Yeah. Anytime you're proving an implication yeah. directly... Yeah then the, the direct way to prove it is to assume the if oh, assume and prove the then, right? Yeah. So the implication of induction is n equals k implies n equals k so plus one. So assumes. we assume the k, right? So this is two assumptions. But the actual statement of the problem is an implication, right? So oh, when we yeah, prove this, right. then we assume the if. Yeah? Of course, you don't have... Not every prime factor is going to divide n squared. Like, but like we have to have an assumption. So that's why it's yeah. an assumption. The problem is an assumption. Okay, so if p to the k plus 1 divides n plus n, right, then p to the k divides um, n plus n. n. So, it's trivial, so it, it, no, it, it trivially satisfies the hypothesis, right? So we can first of all get that p to the k divides n squared, yeah? So uh, you said p to the k. Yeah, oh. but there's more, there's, there's, that's, that's a stronger assumption than this, right? Um, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, if there's k plus 1, then k of them also divide. So divided, basically, yeah? the induction is trivial itself. Well, you, well I mean, you have, you have to see how it goes, right? Because, like, if you uh, induction plus 1, then, like, it'll always be a hot, stronger statement than the 1. Yeah, I know, but then you, you but, but the, the conclusion is a weaker conclusion, right? Yeah. Yeah? So you need the conclusion to p to the k, p to the k plus 1 divides n squared. Yeah? Does that make sense? We only have p to the k right now. Yeah. Okay. So for simplicity, see, there's some notation you can do with n k equals odd. Like you can do the ceiling or thing, but I think it's better just to see, see what happens if k is odd and when k is even. Yeah. So can you see if k is odd is actually trivial? So you know why it's trivial? Because uh, if k is odd, like three or five, yeah. Then like when you add one to it or take one. You assume it becomes an even factor, which means you can divide m plus n with. Yeah, so when k is odd, because the point is n squared as a square number, yes. right? 
because like has to have an even number of so times, PK is right? also even. So, so if P is odd, P, if the power of P is odd, it really means that the next one is also there. So, oh, yeah, yeah? yeah. If P cubed divides N squared, then P4 divides N squared. Yeah. Right? Because N squared yeah, has to have an even number of... If you have three of them, you definitely have the fourth one. Yeah? yeah? Oh, okay. That makes, sense? That, that, that makes a lot of sense. Because they're prime numbers, they cannot be uh, decomposed any further. Yeah. So, so another way of saying it, for example, like say if K is odd, right? So it equals two L minus one, yeah? Yeah. So you don't say, so the posh way of saying K is odd is okay. No, nah, actually, I think it's better to just say K is odd. Oh, okay. Okay. So. There's no posh way because if you, if you somehow inhibit the understanding of what you're doing, bad. that's bad, yeah? So whatever it is. Why do mathematicians like to do that? It saves time. Right? It saves time when you're writing. But these, like back in the day, right? Like you, you couldn't even publish a paper that was like more than a page because of the cost of printing and all this crap and typing. <laughs> like, so if you had notation that simplified your writing but confused the argument, you'd probably use it. But now there's really no excuse, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, but we're actually talking about competition stuff where you're handwriting it and you have lots of paper and time. Yeah. Your goal is just to make someone who's really going to understand it, right? Yeah. Mm. Okay. So if k is odd, so for example, k is equal to 2l minus 1, right? Mm -hmm. um, so p to the 2l minus 1 divides n squared, yeah? Yeah. So therefore, um, p to the... L my L P to the L divides N. Yeah? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? So therefore P to the two L divides N squared. Yeah? That's it. Well yeah, because if you double the N squared, there's two N which is K plus one. Which, which is K plus two which is K plus, K plus one, right? So it works. Yeah. Are you sure? Sure about what? P to the L divides N. Yeah. Wait. So basically if P to the L doesn't divide N, right? Yeah. Um, Wait. So if less than p to the l divides n, then less than p to the t um, two l minus one will divide n squared, right? Which is impossible because the next highest is l minus one. Yeah. So if you have p to the l minus one divides n, right? Yeah. Then p to the if that's the most you can have, then the most you can have that divides n squared is p to the l minus two, two, two l minus two, two which right? is not yeah. two l minus one. Two l minus two. You have to double it. Oh yeah, yeah, but like those things as two, P to two. That's why it's a contradiction. You can't have. Yeah, so I'm saying my thing is one less than two L. One thing, one more than two L minus two, Wait, right? In these, that's the whole point. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah like... if I had one less, I double it. I have one less than what I have, right? And I'm saying that's at most how many I have. So if I have more than I've contradicted it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but its basic premise is basically like if P cubed divides N squared. Then the fourth thing has to be and there. And P right? fourth must yeah. divide n squared. Yeah, because if P cubed divides n squared, right? Then P squared has to divide n. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, okay. oh, yeah. Yeah, because if P only P divides n, then P squared can only divide n squared, right? So get up to the cube, you need the squared to divide the n. You can probably. Use I've already spent way too much time on this yes. triviality. Yes. Can I wow. can I go on? Yes, you can go on. Just make sure, just tell us, can, can in the competition, can you skip this? You just mention it. You don't have to skip it. Like, make people aware that you're aware of it. Oh, okay. You can even, like, if you're really confident, you could just say it's trivial, but you better get the rest of the question right. Yeah. You know? But I don't want to promote overconfidence. This isn't the NBA, okay? <laughs> oh, yeah. But isn't it on the confidence that usually gets you in the AI? Well, it depends. I mean, like sometimes being sure of something, that underconfidence, not being sure, actually leads to a step that's yeah, essential. Yeah, like that. like yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is obviously more helpful in these nine-hour competitions than they are in the one-hour <laughs> test. <laughs> okay, anyway, back to this. So K odd is taken care of, yeah? Yeah. So maybe we can do K even. This avoids us using weird notation, yeah? Oh, okay. So K odd is done, yeah? Yeah. Kevin. Kevin. No, it's, it's Kevin. Oh, wow. Kevin. There's a person on great whose name is spelled like that. <laughs> it's funny because like the spelling affects the pronunciation. So when you spell it a certain way and then people pronounce it naturally and then it's wrong, oh, does okay. it mean you spelt it wrong? 
because like i mean it's not like it's like a naturally an english word you have to create it yes right so that means you so made it anyway it can, you created the english word in optimum so k is even it's equal to 2l for example right okay so then p to the k so p to the 2l divides n squared yeah 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 so therefore p to the l divides n oh yeah n. Well, yeah yes uh -huh. i do get it Yes, good. Yeah. 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 And M, yeah? Yeah. Yes? Mm. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. You are saying the input. Right. Yeah. So maybe I'll just I'll write the next part in the N R equals 1 case because it actually is the R equals 1 case, okay? So then what happens is P, so what do we have? Let me just rephrase this. So we have p to the k plus one, right? Divides m plus n, yeah. So let me just leave that. And then p to the yeah k plus one divides m plus n, right? And then we have p to the l divides m and p to the l divides n, yeah. yeah. So basically what that means is you can divide everything by P to the L, right? So oh. this is P to the L, yeah? yeah. P to the L. Yeah. And now there's L less now, right? So this was 2L plus 1 becomes L plus 1. Yeah. Yeah? This you get P to the L less. This is P to the L less, right? Oh, so that is going to be P. It's just P, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Like. So actually we only need P here, right? Yeah. For the... We don't need the L plus one, it's actually overkill. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Cool. Because we only actually need that this divides one of them, right? Yeah. And it also divides the sum, uh, right? Divides, so yeah. therefore it divides both, right? Yeah. And, but in particular, since the problem is stated for, P, for N, it yeah. divides N on P to the L. Yeah? Yeah? So if P divides N on P to the L, right? Do I need to keep talking? Oh, uh, then P divides N to the... So P to the L plus one, to, yeah, L it, plus it divides one. N, right? Yeah. And then P to the two L plus two divides N, so P to L, two L plus one. Yeah, that's yes. Yeah, that's yeah, oh, that's k plus two. So k plus one is also yes. So yeah. p plus p to the k plus one is because it's even, one. right? You can't even get to the odd one because you get yeah, you have yeah, to get yeah. to the next one, right? So p to the l plus one equals n. That makes one. sense because odd things can't divide p to the p k plus one equals. Well, I mean, like by themselves, yeah. P to the k plus one divides n squared as required. Yeah. Are so, we are we in the same boat here? Yes. So we do prove both. It feels weird because like if you're we like uh, show our the solution, we like understand like every step of it. But then like if you're asked to replicate it, it's like oh hard. <laughs> like yeah, you think okay, nah, it's like oh what's this step again? Yeah. yeah. But I guess this is the, the 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 underlying guide, right? This statement plus induction on R, yeah. Yeah. Because then it's like you, then you're just chasing the requirements of induction. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, if this doesn't make sense right now, this recording can be replayed mm -hmm. at least 300 times before... No, I'm just kidding. Like, it can be replayed <laughs> quite a lot before your time is up. <laughs> what? For the uh, exam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you meant How many times is going to be replayed until November 9th? I thought you meant the November end. <laughs> so, not during the test. <laughs> no, I mean the very, very end. Oh, okay. No, no, no. We don't have that much time. <laughs> it's like it's like we've already made it finish at nine. Then it just it doesn't end. It doesn't just <laughs> go on to Tuesday. I was actually thinking you could put like a bunk bed in that little desk <laughs> area. <laughs> if we really get into it, but what have you to do it. Because sometimes, oh, we we have to sleep. Oh, but like you know, if we continue early in the morning. Like, oh man! Only is it the sufficient cute. Yeah. <laughs> Why? What are you doing? Holy moly. What? We should probably do 
Yeah, so I... Wait, so we agreed with that? Yeah, yeah. now yes. I get it. Yes, sir. Like, right. why does... Well, I hope it's not wrong, but yeah. <laughs> well, I'll give you the answers. I have the answers in mind. The answers. I don't like when you say the answers. Because there is no the answers. Yeah. Well, there is the answer provided by the committee, so... Yeah, but I mean, from my experience... You guys are really yeah. sketchy. I like one card off one. Obviously, I mean, there's, yeah. there's no difference between... But you still have four more to right now. Yeah, it's not really a difference between the answer I come up with and um yeah, I mean very shiny. an expected value I guess. Huh? On eBay. Like when? Like a month ago. Okay, so that was that one. Um so I wanna talk about the algebra homework as well. So you notice how a lot of this homework and stuff is really giving you exercises in the writing down proofs? Yes? Yeah. This is the point, okay? Because you guys, while have very good ideas, you underrepresent them when you write them on paper, okay? That makes sense? And some of them are purely subconscious ideas as well that don't make their way to the conscious nor the written level. There's three levels where um, before we had um, P to the L divides N and P to the L divides M. Yes. Yeah. So then from that we concluded that like P to the P divides M to M times N on P to the L by two L. Oh, did we do that? Uh, so like okay, so we did the mod like we concluded that like P divides the multiplication. So yeah, P divides N on P to the L and times M on yeah yeah. And we also concluded that p to the l plus one divides m like the um, addition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wait, so, how, what did the l plus one? Oh, because the assumption was that p to the k plus one divides the addition. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's why we got. Otherwise, we'd be stuck because we yeah. didn't have any p's. Yeah. Because two l was k, right? So two yeah. k, two l plus one was the p to the k plus one. So that's where that extra p came from. Oh. And then the l plus one. Well, I mean, 2L plus 1 is K plus 1, right? Yeah. And the L divided the M. Yeah. We're good? I think so, yeah. And then... So then we basically, we, we don't actually need all L plus 1 of them. We just need the 1. Yeah. Yeah. Because then P divides one of them and the sum. So it must divide both. It must divide both. Yeah. And if it divides both, it divides... And on P to the L. Yeah. Right? Which oh, means sure. this P to the L plus one thing is dividing N. Yeah. So then you have to double that to divide N squared. Yeah. Oh, so like it's proving. So I, I didn't double because that. Because P to the L is divisible by N. So basically, what's it saying? All this proving is that if a certain number of prime factors is divisible by one, is divides n. That means uh, another one will always divide n. Yeah. So this at this at the same time, not only does it illustrate the divisibility stuff we're learning, it actually illustrates right. Yeah. Yeah. Power puns are very interesting. Well, oh, like like maybe there's a pun that was unintended, but like what? Which pun? Well, the power of the prime. What the? Hell? So it. it, it so I don't get it. Well, we can solve these problems in numbers by considering primes, right? Primes, the semi series. You can't solve. Why, why do I keep like every time I figure something out, I get another problem? Oh, so uh, maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, so, like, we have that P divides, um, like the multiplication. Um, this one, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how do we get that? Like, yeah. Oh, because it's a prime, right? Yeah, so it has to divide one of them. Uh, no, like, yeah, because how do you show that? Like, how do you show P divides that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, because we said. <laughs> P to the k plus one, right? Divides n plus one n. That was the assumption. And that divides m n, right? So therefore, p to the k plus one divides m n. Yeah. Yeah. I'll probably rewrite it. P to k. Wait, should I not have erased it? No, it's fine. I think I did. I erase it too. It's on a live stream. Yeah. will be the until the time has deleted. Yeah. So if you can find it. All right. I think if you pour enough for yourself, yeah. I'm just going to drink the rest.
Uh, there is no. Oh, the recipe. Alright, go for it. So next proof. Ah, it's not really enough. Yeah. So like, Alright, so next one. What was that list of stuff we did? Some stupid theory. Can knowing. someone else write the definitions of these things? Because definition. Remember the email I sent? Define domain, codomain, range, image, kernel, group, group homomorphism, one to one, isomorphism. <laughs> it just yeah. sounds funnier when I read it like that. Yeah, it sounds hard. It does. But we actually did define all these things, okay? What, really? Yes. When? One last week. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> what? Mm hmm. SN subgroup Cartesian product of sets. Look this up yourself. <laughs> How's isomorphism? That's it. That was it. That was the, the first exercise. The Union Dictionary. Let's see. Do I need to define them, or do you all sort of know them? Oh, domain. Okay. I know how your answers actually correlate to the truth. By the way, the only re the only really thing we learned in this group is domain and range at school. Yeah, yeah. We learned a lot of stuff. So you should have learned codomain. Codomain is basically like the domain of two things and. So the co so the range is like it's kind of like you don't know the range, right? Because you know you know that you can put stuff in the domain into the function, right? But you don't know what's gonna come out, right? Like the range is like a calculation. Mm -hmm. So the codomain kind of takes the place of the range. It's kind of just a bigger set which it goes to, right? But it doesn't have to get everything in there. Whereas the range is a smaller set of the actual outputs. So the bigger set is the possible outputs. Yeah, of these types of sort of like the a priori possible outputs, yeah, and then the range is like the actual outputs that the function actually spits out. Does that make sense? No, like actually, what do you mean by actually? Like I don't know. Like for example, you can define the function from the real numbers as a domain, real numbers as a codomain, and like be sine sine of x, right? So. Sine of x, the actual range is from minus one to one. Oh, yeah? codomain. Okay, yeah, so, so the regardless codomain, of the function, the codomain just has to be a bigger set than the range. But then you you don't know what the range is in the first place. So you just gotta. So it's gotta be obvious that the outputs are members of the oh, codomain. Okay. Yeah. Range, image. So image means the same as range. Oh, kernel. Okay. Oh, yeah. Kernel. So do you know what pre-image is? So the pre-image of a set is the, the subset of the domain that maps to that set. So what? like, so like the pre-image. Uh, does that make sense? The pre-image of like, um, like. Let's give me an example of a function. Uh, y was x squared. Y was x squared. Yeah. Okay. So you're still in this kind of way of denoting function. Yeah. Yeah. The f of x. x equals x squared. I guess, and then the, the domain maybe is like reals. The codomain. Okay. Oh, the, so the yeah. domain is real and the codomain is real. Yeah. But the, um, but the but range, the range, is, range positive. is positive. Yeah. So Non-negative. For, for example, you could have the... So the pre-image... So we call the pre-image oh, no. of R, right? It's all the things that um, output inside this set R. Okay? So can you see that that's the entire domain, right? Huh? The function, the pre the pre image. So yeah. So this is a conflicting notation really... with inverse function, but like what's like this is not this is a, an inverse function. No, this is a set notation. Okay. Uh, the pre image. So then we could have like the pre image of the set that just contains like um one and two. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's the set of all the things in the domain which map into this set. So this is. This is one minus one minus root two and root two. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. That I understand. Sense. Yeah. So actually, the kernel of a group homomorphism is oh, the pre image, pre image of zero, okay? Of the identity. Also, the roots. Is that what you mean? Like mm -hmm. The roots? The inverse function, kind of. The roots of the inverse function? Kind of, yeah, like the pre image is like kind of finding the image of the inverse function, sort of, if there was an inverse function. But like it could be multiple things if they're the same thing, yeah. So like That's why it's got the inverse an function. Inverse notation. relation. Yeah. Put it that way. 
Yeah, it's got, it could go. Because the function is a type of relation. It's the many things that could go to that one thing. Yeah. Wow. And how is this related to sets? Hmm? You know these sets groups. Yeah. How is it? Related? So I'm saying the, the kernel is the kernel is actually the pre-image of the identity. Yeah. Oh. So why do you call you zero the identity? Kernel? Why do you call zero? So you have a group homomorphism, right? Yeah. Why, right? The kernel. Well, I mean, you don't need to be a group homomorphism to find the kernel, but it's only really meaningful when it's a group homomorphism because it has theory attached to it. So the kernel of phi is equal to the pre-image of the identity. What is then the identity? So I, yeah. I don't know what is it, what you mean refer by i h. Yes, yeah, so this is the problem. Yeah. Um. So a group, so I, I said to define these things anyway, didn't I? Group. Yeah. Huh? What's the point of the property? You can know these I guess but how does this they, they have nice properties in set theoretic, set, nice set theoretic properties. Are we using set theory? Are we using these words? Let's actually just get back onto the point and move on to pussy ball. <laughs> no. Yet. Because there's like three other people here. Oh, okay. So we have quite a question. Oh. Let's see if he goes. That's yeah. a sideboard, okay? Okay, okay. okay, okay. Can you understand? So, okay, look. I'll define these things quickly, but like you have to understand them quickly, or so I'm going to skip them, okay? So, domain is the set which the function has to have. It take, has to take responsibility for all the things in the domain, right? It has to tell you some where they go. Yeah. So that's what the domain it can't is. be undefined. Yeah, it can't be everything in the domain has to go somewhere, okay? Code and it has to go somewhere in the codomain. Okay. So that's the only so it's another code domain is another set and it's part of the definition of the function. Okay. So the range is the actual set of things that get output by the function. Yeah? Okay. So there's always an input that actually outputs that thing. Yeah. For, for it to be in the range. Yeah. range. Different. Okay, so, so range is a subset of the codomain. Yeah, yeah, so range is the stuff that I could have been and codomain is like that set. Yeah, like a bigger set. Yeah. Yeah? So at this moment in time, right, if you're defining the function, yeah, so I it'd be convenient to say reals to reals, right? Yeah. But then you realize the range is all positive. Yeah, positive. Yeah? Yeah, so range is positive. Does that make sense? Okay. So the image is also the same as the range, but image can be used for group as well. Yeah. And I guess it can also be used for So group. what's, how do you define like a group, like a set? Equals range, yeah? yeah? Okay, huh? What do you mean like a group? Like how do you define a group? Yeah, so I'm gonna define a group now. So group is a set with an operation, okay? So did I tell you to look up Cartesian product? So if you have X cross Y, yeah? yeah. Do you know what that set is? What? Yeah, you've got to read the emails, do the homework, okay? And this is so much more important than your school stuff. It's ridiculous, okay? All right, so X cross Y. And, and this is not for everyone, okay? But in, in, in respect to the priorities in your lives, okay? And I'm looking after those, okay? This is more important. So X times Y, okay? If you have two sets, X and Y, yeah? X cross Y is the set of pairs. So this is the set of pairs, ordered pairs, right? So there's the first and second thing, yeah? yeah? Such that the first thing is in the first set and the second thing is in the second set. Oh, okay. Does so that make sense? So basically a more, a more like a defined version of picking two things from two bags or something. All the ways yeah. you can do that. So I guess, you know, like... Like yeah, picking, like if you have the set, one okay, if you have the set of one, two, three, right? Yeah. And then that's X, yeah? Yes. And then you have the set of A, B, C, right? Yes. That's Y. Uh, then there will be one then A, one X B, one C. Y, two okay. A, two B, one C. One A, one B, one C. Two A, two B, two C. And three A, three B, three C. Wait a second. How many are there? Nine. 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 Yeah. Is that important? Sorry, I just... It is important because that's why it's called the product, right? Yeah. yeah. Because sets are classified by their size. So we have a way of constructing so, the product of the sizes yeah, with yeah, another yeah. set. Yeah. There's a natural construction. Oh, that should be really fun. Because if the size, yeah. the sizes is just times, times. 
Yeah, no, I, I think you got to you can't, you got to at least read the emails. Then you can at least feel guilty you didn't do this. <laughs> the only thing I remember was the Chinese you made the same. But like, it's just I like, didn't, like I didn't you pick out a race. I don't, I don't think I got it. Do you think it's your spam? Um, hold no, on. it's not here. I understand. It's probably your spam thing. Probably there. I sent it only to you four. Wait, you sent it to me. I I don't, I don't know if I sent this to you. Because you never showed up for like three weeks. Yeah. I didn't think it would be relevant, but here we are, it is. Yes. But see, why would you like even need to make a judgment on that? <laughs> because really... other stuff. Wow. Other stuff not okay. Okay. Does that make sense? There's nine things, right? Yeah. And the order matters. You have to write the first one in the first step first, yeah? Yes. Or else. Because the same thing could be picked. The two, two, yeah. two sets that's, it's of called it, it's, it's, that's why they're called ordered pairs, okay? You know? Okay, anyway. So the reason I wanted you to define Cartesian product first, it might help us define what a group is, yes. okay? So group G, okay? So first of all, there's a set G, okay? Yeah. Oh, is it this one? Okay. Yeah. What this? Yeah. I'm yeah, I waste all my time typing this stuff up. Okay, so G. Okay, there's a set G, right? Yeah. You can think of this set G cross G. Okay. It's just self squared. And there's a function, maybe we call it dot. Okay. It goes from G cross G to G. Yeah. Okay. And that's called the operation. That's an operation. An operation is when you take two things and you multi sort of multiply them. Yeah. So we call it dot, yeah? It's a function of two things. So this is a set, so this set makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can have a function from the pairs into this, yeah? Uh, yeah, if you think of multiplication of real numbers, that's a function from R cross R to R, right? Yeah. Where you take A, B, and it goes to A times B, yeah? Okay. Yeah. That makes sense? Here we take G, H, and it goes to, I mean, this is just notation, it's not really meaningful. G dot H, right? So that's a so that's a, a set with an operation, yeah? It's not quite a group, yeah? So there has to exist an identity, okay? So there has to exist an element, um, E, inside of G, right? Such that in this operation, E doesn't change any other, uh, all the other elements. So. Oh, that's what you mean by the additive identity and the multiplicative identity yeah. of zero and one. So, and we don't actually know it's commutative, so we have to say G dot oh. E is equal to G in both directions for all G, okay? So that, that's what it means to exist the identity. Yeah. Okay, and just to brush you up, we actually had the exercise to show that was unique. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so it ca there can't be two identities. There can't be two identities. Well, what was the truth? Uh, well, okay. don't, don't worry about it right now, okay? So, the, so does that make sense? So that's the first... One of the first axioms, yeah? There's three axioms. Another one is it's, it's associative, right? Yeah. So that just means G dot H dot K. I don't know why I chose these letters, sorry. Equals G dot H dot K for all yeah. G, H, K in the group, yeah? Yes? Associative and community. It's not community. Okay, it may not be community. Yeah. We don't assume it. If it's community, we call it an abelian group. Okay, but if we say group, we don't assume it's community. Okay, so it might matter what order you take this G and H, yeah? So that's identity. This is associativity. And the next yeah. one is community. Inverse. 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 We, I said there was no community, oh, okay. yes? Community was when you had... Um, oh, okay, so, so associativity defines the group, but... Then commutativity can be divided onto the group. It can be right. added. So yeah, it could also be commutative. Yes. But then if it is, it's called a commutative group or an abelian group. Okay? So we're just thinking all that for now. Inverse means for every G, every element in G, right? Okay? There exists an, an, a H in G such that G dot H equals the identity, which we said was unique. Let's just call it one now. And then h dot g equals the identity. Okay. Does that make sense?
Yeah. I know some people. Oh, okay. So that means if you, it's like for addition, <laughs> there can always be the negative of a number. Yeah. In the yeah. multiplication, there can always be a reciprocal. reciprocal of the number. Yeah. But there's always two. There's always two elements in a group. Yeah. So if you take this, this this is not a group, right? You have to remove zero from the set, yeah, and then because, it's a group. Yeah, because it's okay. Because then you can reciprocate everything except the zero. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so those are the three axioms, yeah. But then there's only really two operations. There's only addition and multiplication. Oh, this is. Oh, so the actual operation that we were focusing on, remember, was composition of functions. Yeah. Remember, because that's like the first example of a non-commutative operation you got you got to learn, right? Yeah. Remember, when we're composing permutations, composing functions is not commutative. Yeah. Yeah. So like, see, because if you have inverse functions, right? Identity function, and then you have um, fun com function compositions associated, because you're just putting them in sequence, right? Okay, anyway, so I'm going to erase this now. Mm. Yeah? Makes. Seems like it. <laughs> yeah. He's adopting the lingo again. He's, he's back with us. <laughs> I mean, this. No, it literally seems like it. Like, we define these things. So it seems like it. <laughs> seems it's legit, maybe legit, not really legit. <laughs> mm. Now, next. Sometimes when you say seems legit, it sounds like seems legit. <laughs> it's like you can't be bothered to like verify that it's legit. No, so you just like seems and agree it's legit. But there's literally no way to verify it because we define these things. Like, well, I mean, you define it, then you can verify like statements about them, right? Like, this is the definition of a group. This set is a group. Now they're like not two independent <laughs> statements anymore, right? Yeah. Like once you define a group, this thing is either a group or it's not. Mm. Or the thing was not defined in the first place. <laughs> okay. So if you have a function from one group to the other, yeah? yeah? It's called a group homomorphism if phi of g dot h is equal to phi of g dot phi of h for all g, h, and g. Does that make sense? So what's this phi function? Yeah, it's a function. Wow. wow. Yeah, yeah. So group. So oh. phi, phi doesn't have to be a group. Well, phi is function. Is function. This is just so confusing, but I do kind of get it. Yeah. Phi I think I think you're actually getting it really fast in your subconscious, but your conscious is not caught up. Oh yes, I can. Yeah, I get it consciously now. Right. So if you have a function. And then you have a function. No, you're amazed how smart some people are subconsciously. Um, do these dots mean the same thing? Yeah. Well, you have to make it clear. The operations, yeah. yeah so the operations preserved. The operations preserved by the function. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they have the but, same function. Okay, yeah. They have the same operation. Yeah. So you can like you can oper like you can you can procrastinate operating on them before you map it over. And you can actually operate them later. That's yeah. called a hormone. For example, but like, is that for all all functions? Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a homomorphism if the function satisfies this condition. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Also, it's a function that is not the group is homomorphic itself. It's the I function. think it should also satisfy the condition that phi of the identity is I equal mean, to is equal to the identity. Yeah, but I think it, it might follow. Well, we'll see. Because naturally, you wanted to preserve everything so about the group, right? Yeah. So naturally, you should preserve the definition. So okay. that's the operation, together with the identity, together with the inverse. Yeah, that, I think that kind of implies it. Yeah, yeah but maybe this will imply it too. Okay. Because G and H can be because G and H can be inverses of each yeah. other. Then it will then it will work. Okay. So the kernel of a, a group homomorphism, right, is the pre-image of the identity. So now this makes sense now, right? So it's all the things in G that go to the identity in H. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the function is homomorphic to the group if that condition applies. In terms mm -hmm. of conditions apply. No, the, the function is, is also a group homomorphism if this condition applies. Yeah? So it's a property of functions. Okay. To a specific group.
to a specific group. I mean, once you have the function, right, you have to already nominate the groups and the rule. Yeah. And then if the rule happens to satisfy this. This yeah. seems more and more like magic. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So the kernel is all the things that map to the identity. Yes. yes. Okay. So do you remember what a one to one function is? Yeah. Yeah. One to one, one to function, yeah? Many to one function. One to one function. So one to one function is the ones where like you can't have two things mapped to the same thing, yeah? So the special thing about groups, right? So obviously if it's one to one, then it can't have more than two things mapped to the identity, right? So yeah, there's only yeah? one and the inverse. Yeah. But what, what for groups, if the kernel equals the identity, okay? Yeah. Right? So we're, I think we're assuming or we're going to eventually prove that the identity goes to the identity, yeah? yeah? That's the only, if that's the only thing that goes to the identity, so that the kernel equals just that one thing, right? Then phi is one to one. Oh, oh yeah. That's the point of defining the kernel. Yeah. So it suffices just to check on one element, yeah? Oh, okay. Okay. So that means, uh, but we have, but the function can be anything. Huh? What is the limits of the function? Right. It's a group homomorphism. Also, only if the, it's a group homomorphism, this applies. Yeah. This the, Otherwise, everything below. Obviously, applies. it doesn't apply to general functions, right? Yeah, yeah. Just define any function where that's not true. Yeah, that would be okay. pretty true. And there'll be easy to find one. Okay? And so, if it's only like a group homomorphism, if it only, you know what one to one is. Yeah, you explained it. It's basically like yeah. a reversible function. Yeah. If uh, you like can execute. Yeah. So David, you're understanding this rather well. I think you just don't like working so hard to understand it. <laughs> okay, anyway. So if kernel phi is equal to this, then the so, phi is one to one. So if the operation of that the group defined preserves through a function, then if the, it means that if the function map, if the function of the identity is reverse mapped to the identity, then it is a one to one function. Yeah, so if the only thing that goes to that is this, then it's one to one. What's yeah. the difference between i g one g and one h? One g comes from there. One h is in there. Oh, because a function of a group is still function. It's still group. Like if you apply a function to a group. No, no, no. We're assuming these are groups. So assume g is a group. And also assume h is a group. Yeah. Okay. If you don't assume that, you oh, can't define group homology because there's no operation here, right? You need an operation yeah, on this yeah. to make sense. Yeah, you need at least that to have an operation and that have an operation for this to be defined, right? Yeah. So much. Okay, so one to one. So isomorphism just means that this has an yeah. inverse function, right? Yeah. Well, the definition is actually that it has an inverse function that's a group homomorphism as well, but it actually follows that it will be a group homomorphism. Yeah. So basically, if this has an inverse function, then this is an isomorphism. Okay. So another way of saying that is if it's one to one and on two, right? Yeah. So if the kernel is trivial, right? That makes it one to one. Yeah. And if it's on two, right? Then it's an isomorphism. Okay. The, wait, the, main, the main criticism of math is that of these kind of math is that it doesn't apply to your to your actual life. Well, the, the, the knowledge doesn't, right. but the the, yeah. the idea of the application. Well, how does the applications apply? I mean, making your life efficient, I think, has a lot to do with the elegance of your thinking, right? Um. Yeah, I mean, and this this is a very elegant way to describe other things which are very concrete, which which demonstrated last week. Okay, you can go watch that video. Hit the like and subscribe button. I don't need Amazing any subscribers. Music. Yeah. But why not? Wouldn't it be great if you had like two million subscribers? It'd be impossible to have two million subscribers. There's not two million people like. In this world, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, just go to some a boarding website like T Series does, and I'll just like buy some drivers. Yeah, hmm. so Eddie, you have like 
700,000 subscribers. But he's, he's doing something else, yeah? Yeah, he's, he's, he's trying to interest sure people that. into... School. Yeah, it's yeah. people who are forced to do maths. Yeah. And it's lots and of trying to like, it's stuff they're forced to do. He's lessening the pain of people who are forced to do maths. Yeah? yeah? This is a totally different goal than what we have. Also stage. We're, we're kind of lessening the pain <laughs> in a, <laughs> of people who want to do maths. <laughs> yeah, and and we're, we're actually trying to like not lessen the pain, but it's going positive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seems legit. Seems legit. Okay. Right, what is hey, it? My new catchphrase. Zero doesn't, isn't part of it. Well, what? It's sure. taking a bit too thinking. long. Yes. So okay, the subgroup. Do you know what a subgroup is? So basically, if you take G and you have a subset of G, right, and you restrict the operation to K cross G, K, right, and it ends up going into K, right? What? If you okay, yeah. And it makes it into a group with this operation, right? Oh, okay. With the new operation with the restricted domain. Yeah, so if you take a subset of G, right? Yes. And then and you restrict the group. operation and it becomes an operation on K, right? Oh. And it makes it a group, then K is a subgroup. Oh. That so it's a subset that's also a group. Yeah, but with the same show, operation, yeah. It's a naturally group? it's a natural yes. subset. Oh. Yeah. Can you show a subset that doesn't make it a subgroup of a group? Yeah, just take any one element of the group that's not the identity. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah, so that's the like permutation thing we were talking about. Yeah. See, this is all tying together now for some people. For well, some people, maybe not me, but okay. Like, K times K equals K. What? No, K no, is 2K, a that's not an equal sign. Uh, times, not, times, right? K is just <laughs> We just defined oh, what oh, that oh, symbol oh. meant. Yes, now I, I can feel like you're not listening. I am not a student. No, no, no. I, I would say it's a rookie error, but I hardly consider like <laughs> in a rookie error? error to really listen to a hundred things. Oh, the arrow of the K is <laughs> yeah. represent any element in the subgroup. So there's only one element and you call it a subgroup. But it, does, it would definitely help to have paid attention previously and reviewed some of the material previously. <laughs> it's like clapping in the order of like people who didn't participate in those things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. Next one. Yeah. So I guess my job here is to ease your suffering right now. <laughs> All right, so that's a subgroup, okay? So I'm just going to do some more research now. Anyways. So you yeah. got K. I just gave you minutes. all the information and then you, know, you just said, yeah. I'm going to forget it and like relearn that. Oh. It's all right. It's all right. What's the next? Researching is good for some. Okay. So the next one was define symmetric group. So symmetric group SN. Okay. Remember what N SN was? What, it was the set of all the functions, right? Oh, it's That's not the arithmetic series. From, from, like from, from yeah, from an N element set to yeah. itself, basically. Yeah. yeah? That were invertible. Oh, uh, yeah, so it's one to one. That's basically an F Yeah, it's by, no, uh, by one, one Y applies it onto it in this case. Yeah. So it's F just, F it has N element set, right? Yes. It's a function with that as the domain and codomain. That's invertible. How long is it? What that's does invert? Invertible one to one. one. It means you can have an inverse function. Yeah, so one to nice. one, basically. Yeah. Two exactly. Two. A one to one oh. function. And then there's n factorial. And then we had a notation called cycle so notation. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. And then you have n to the n, which is all the functions. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, n to the n is all the functions, yes. And an n to the n minus n factorial is all the non invertible. Yeah. yeah. It's not watching Oh, good, good. I think you're getting it. Except for like k times k thing. That's how it works. Anyways, so I wonder where I get all this information. Okay, so some of, this, some of the things that they were exercised, maybe I can show you now, okay? Oh, how does it work? I'm not sure if I did this in the right order. Mm, I have it somewhere. So what did I show? So I showed that a group homomorphism, right, 
Yeah. What was that one? What was that defined again? <laughs> oh, okay, sure. Okay, He's yeah. just trolling me, everyone. <laughs> homomorphism. What's up, homomorphism? No, no, no. No, <laughs> no, no. no, no, no. What, what would be bad is like, what's a homomorphism? Then I explain it, and then he's like, what's a group? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like you ask the advanced notion, and then you wait for them to explain it, then you ask the simpler notion. Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's a, a function? Set? What's a number? Well, actually, I guess it would make sense if you use the word group to explain group form. Oh, yeah. And then you naturally wonder what group means also. Oh, yeah. But then like, yeah. But, like, did you not... Wait, so, wait, what does how, how about next time you explain this backwards? <laughs> I actually need to know what it means. You know? Basically a bunch of sets. Yeah. Well, we just we defined it. We just defined it. You can watch this video over and over again. Yeah. Actually... Oh my say a number Just say a oh, homomorphism is, is a function. Yeah, it's is a, it's an attribute of a of a function. Well, just, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a function between groups. Yeah, that preserves its the multiplication. That pre because can yeah. a group have more than one operation? Uh, well, it, it can, but to be considered the same <laughs> thing, yeah. um, because like, be called so something else. You see how many times this guy called me? Like, it's a they have to be compatible right? with each other for it to be a bigger structure. So our purpose is a group is one, one operation. Yeah. So homomorph group homomorphism is a function that preserves that operation. Yeah. In, in some sense, you could have like an automorphism with itself. And that it could give another operation. Yeah. So the same set could have two different operations. But at the same time, it's a different structure. Okay. Thank you. Show that a group homomorphism. Yeah, five preserves inverses, okay? Two by preserves inverses. I guess part of that is it's like it preserves the identity. So inverse like this identity plus some elements. So this is like it preserves the actual definition of the group, right? Um, preserve. So the image is a subgroup. Image is subgroup. Is uh, like I'll call. I use this. Uh, I'll just write sub. Oh, this the question. Of the so the range of the function oh. has to be a subgroup of the group. Range of a group homomorphism has to be a yes. subgroup. Yeah. Hmm. Does that mean uh, it's a one-to-one -one function? Yeah. Okay. Let me show some of these things. Okay. So is it obvious the identity goes the identity? Let's see. Um, well, it preserves the identity. So if you have a look at, it preserves the identity and it preserves uh, the inverse. Wonder if preserving the identity has a positive definition. Now let's assume it preserves the identity for now, okay? All right, and see what happens if it preserves the inverses. Yeah. So preserves the what does preserves the inverse mean? The preserve G inverse yes. equals five G inverse. inverse. Yeah. Wait, we're using inverse as in like as in the sense of the definition of the group yeah the one of the conditions was every element had an inverse yeah yeah okay so we have phi of oh, but you've you met david before? no oh, no sorry i should introduce you guys oh, my bad sub um which are you in yes okay okay that makes a lot of sense. Actually. Which means I'm fine. I'm in the bottom half. Oh, okay. So, so if if so, for example, G inverse, right? What are you doing? He's doing. Yeah, he's doing math. Is it related to this? Yeah. So no. he has a set of image, some objects, and he needs to determine. Yeah. Okay, so like, anyway, a so, set of magic cards. <laughs> yeah, a set of written hexagons. This is. So 5G inverse times G, right? That's equals is one. Equal I didn't see. To, it's equal to 1, right? Yeah. Yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah. But it's also equal okay, to... 5G um, and times 5G inverse. Oh, so okay. 5G inverse times 5G, right? What? That makes sense? Oh, okay. yes. Yeah, so if this also equals 1, yeah? Mm -hmm. So by, sure by the star, yeah? Yeah. If that equals 1 by this assumption... Oh, then those two are inverses. Then those two are inverses, right? So therefore, this is equal to 5G inverse, yeah? Huh? Both of these are equal to 1. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. Oh, because it says it preserves identity, so 5, 
of one tree must be equal to one edge. Yeah. So oh, yeah, it is yeah. also far three. Yeah. Basically, if this, the properties are not satisfied, they'd be part of the definition of group homomorphism. Yeah? So that's, really that's, that's the nature of this exercise. There's one negative one inside the brackets, one outside the brackets. Yeah. It's not really made much difference. Yeah. yeah, so basically, if you find the inverse before you send it through, it's the same as finding the inverse after you send it through. Yeah. yeah. It's a one-to-one yeah. one point. Yeah. And you find it with the... Yeah. One to one function that still makes. Okay, does that also make it clear that the, if, if, if you have G output something, right? So this is the image of, like, the image of G, right? Yes, is 5G. Not only does it have an inverse, right? The uh, inverse of the image as well, yeah? Right, because you express the inverse as 5 something. Oh, okay, yeah. Does that make sense? So not only does it have an inverse, it has an, in, well, it has an inverse. But it's gotten by something in the range. Yeah. Yeah. So the inverse. So I'm saying the image is going to be a subgroup, right? So notice I've shown that it contains oh, inverses. So like you have to show the contingency that every image of any yeah. any or its inverse must also be in the original group. Yeah. So is it clear that the image, you know, has the operation? Because anytime you have something in the domain, the operation stays in there, right? So the image, we, we, if we assume it has an identity, the image has an identity, yeah? And we know it's going to be the same identity as the group. Yeah? Oh, the image identity is the 1H, right? Yeah. Okay. So the image has an identity. It also preserves inverses, right? So everything in the image has its inverse in the image. Because we already right? defined it has, it's a subgroup. Yeah. So it must have. No, 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 we're, we're proving it's a subgroup now. So I guess the only thing we're assuming is this right now. Oh, okay. And we show that this preserves inverses, right? Uh, so it has and we're showing that it's a subgroup. Oh, because it preserves the inverse. It preserves uh, the identity. So it has inverse and identity. And yeah. more like associativity of assuming inverse. Yeah. Yeah, because like you can, that you're already proving something that's stronger than associativity. Mm. Yeah, associativity is, is automatic because the operation was automatically associative. Yes. Yeah. Because it's restricted, right? Okay, so the next thing, well, does it preserve the identity? I mean, let's have a look. So QED is that if so uh, we want to say is a group homo homomorphism, then it makes a subgroup. So can you see that 5G is like is an identity on is equal to the identity in well inside. I mean, this like, this doesn't make quite sense at the moment, but like, it's on the image of image of phi. This is the identity. Yeah, Does that makes sense. Image of phi. So phi phi of one g right times with anything x equals to x for all x in the range of phi. Yeah. I can call five that as well. Wait, I'll so just introduce it. Is that in the? Is that within the so group H? Yeah, this the is subset. all inside H. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because this is a subset of H. Subset of H. Yeah. Because yeah. it's the that the file one G is one H, and that's the identity. Yeah. H. Yeah. So I guess the order of this, we have to show it like this. Yeah. So I guess and so does it preserve the so we already defined it preserves the inverse preserves the identity and so that's all the numbers and we're also shown because it's a group form of morphism it also preserves the operation that's the three things yeah so basically what we're we're showing right in principle the group form morphism the concept right is meant to prove the preserve the, everything in the definition of a group yeah except it's like but value. but it actually only needs to preserve the operation explicitly and the others are implied. Oh, yeah. So you yeah? can like derive it from the um, preservation. Yeah. Process. But in principle, like... It's supposed to do It's all. supposed to... Because the whole point of it is to preserve the, the essence of the group. Yeah. Which is the operation. The function, yeah. Which, but then but what, we're, what we're realizing is that the essence of the group is just the operation. Yeah. It'll automatically contain those properties. Because the group yeah. is just a set with an operation. Yeah. In essence. <laughs> Okay, so so for this to work, the logic is not completely right. So you have to kind of be careful of the order. Okay, uh -huh. so uh, what you might have to say is, so this is obviously a subset of H, right? It contains this, yeah. 
And this, um, well, operates as the identity on everything in that set, yeah? Um, it's also clear that the operation restricted to, to the image, right? Outputs things in the image. Is that obvious? Yes. Like if you take X and Y in the image, right? Yes. And you dot them, yeah? Yes. And that's the same as phi of like A, phi of B, B yeah. right? And that's phi of AB. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the, the restriction of the operation preserves this set, right? Mm. The image, yeah? Oh, uh, yeah. And inside that set is an element this, that's the identity on that set, right? Okay. And inside this set, it also preserves the inverses of all the things in the set, right? So that makes that set a subgroup. Oh, okay, yeah. Does that make sense? So, okay, so the yeah. image is yeah. a subgroup. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and because we showed that the identity of a subgroup is the same as the identity of the whole group, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's actually the identity of the whole group. Oh, okay. Yeah? Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, the identity of the subgroup is the identity of the main group. Mm -hmm. So you're saying 1G and 1A kind of thing. No. Yeah, I'm saying um I'm saying one phi of G oh. is equal to one H. Yeah? Oh yeah. okay. So that's different from phi of one. So you're trying to prove that phi of one G is equal to one phi of G. Uh so I proved that phi 1 of g is equal to 1 phi of g, but I'm trying to say that 1 phi of g is equal to 1 h. Yeah. So yeah. Is, before you didn't necessarily know that, right? It would be the actual, the inverse. Wait, didn't yeah. you already prove phi so 1 g equals 1 h? Inverse subgroup, that means it is, right? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I, I proved, no, no, I assumed that before, right? And proved that. And this is why I'm saying you have to be careful with the logic. So I'm now I'm actually proving something. I'm trying to make it logically rigorous by doing it in the right order. Oh, so you have to prove the yeah. yeah, so I think the order should be, you have a subset of H, that's the image, right, or the range, okay? Um, you look at the operation restricted onto that image and you find that it stays in there, right? Okay, that's this, okay? And then in that, in that subset, so you have an operation, you have an identity with respect to the operation, right, in that set, okay? And you also have inverses in that set using the argument we erased. Yeah? Provided it's the identity in this set. Yeah? Yeah. So therefore, it's a subgroup. Okay? Because we just have to check that the inverses and the identity I are see. in there. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Now that we know it's a subgroup, we know that phi preserves the identity because the identity of the subgroup we showed last week is the same as the identity of the whole group. Yeah. Okay? Do you remember all this? I think you do, subconsciously at least. Oh, okay. So basically, what it means that without consideration to oh. the function, the image, because or else an identity of a subgroup is defined as a like a part of the whole. You you have to take yeah. a certain amount of elements, and then yeah. it makes it makes it so it's a proper. So there was an exercise that you had to show, like if you had a subgroup. With an identity, that identity was actually the same identity. Yeah, yeah. I think I can show you the event Uh Yeah, we, we can't show it right now. We're, just, no, we're no, almost no. running out of time. Wait, if like if I have like I um, of the identity of G is like that, so we know that like that. So we know that the um, inverse is. We know that the identity is in the image of that. How do we? How does it go like to the next step? Wait. So what? What are you saying? We know that. This is in the image, yeah? Yeah, yeah. How do we know that this is true? Uh, yeah, right. we, we know so we know that's true. Oh, you, you understand that's true, yeah? Yeah, yeah. so okay. what about the next one? Like, okay, so, so then this subset has an operation, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the restriction, and it has an identity. And an identity, yeah. Yeah? Um, because this is the identity inside image, yeah? Mm -hmm. Because you agree this was true, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then it also has the inverses. Okay, so I should probably write oh, that yeah, argument yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you just you don't need to like my other argument looked like you assumed it was equal to the identity of the group, but you only need it to be identity in the set. Yeah, so then it has the inverse. So then it's a legitimate subgroup. Okay. Yeah, and then because of that, it would be like the identity. The identity actually promotes to the whole identity. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But actually, you only need the property actually that 
this squares to itself, right? Remember? Oh yeah. That was the only part of the proof we needed to show it was the identity of the whole group. Oh yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I remember. Yeah. Like, so I as long as we find something that squares to itself, then it's the identity. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, we showed as a subgroup anyway. Uh, and, yeah. and so therefore, phi also preserves oh, the identity. Oh, by squaring, you mean like use the operation the to itself, operation yeah. To itself. yeah. Because any other thing that isn't the identity, when you apply the operation, yeah. you have to map for, to a different set. It can never map to the identity. Yeah. Because it's, it, it, I think an, an element can't be an inverse of itself, except for the identity. I like seeing every time I know exactly he understands because he says it all. <laughs> Do we know it needs notice for tournament towns? Um, I think you need to know how to write proofs for tournament towns. Yes, so how do we learn how to write proofs? We, we, we are writing proofs right now. And so, these are pretty simple proofs, right? Simple? They're just yeah. definition chasing. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really understand. I don't know why my brain is so soft. Same. My brain's really cold. I mean, a, so the only complicated part about this is actually a lot of definitions. Yeah. Just but like but you are chasing just the definitions. Yeah. Angle do you know what I mean when I say definition chase? Yes, I do. This is kind of weird. It's like, well, like there's some bits that are, like, new, just some, like, some parts of it relies on you being aware that it's not a proof as well, right? Yeah. Because yes. some of the obvious things don't because work straight assuming, away. Because we're assuming. Yeah. So, like, if we assume straight away that it preserved the identity just because it was the identity in the subgroup, that would yeah. be technically oh, incorrect. It's like we, well, it possibly isn't incorrect, but it's like yeah. But I never said we were working on tournament of talents today, by the way. It was Wednesdays and Fridays, and or maybe next Monday. But like, Wait, what's I say? I mean, this Friday. Just... But we did. I did show you another tournament of talents question just before this. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, so the whole question is so random. You know what you get? You get like algebra, you get geometry, and you get number theory. Yeah, okay. So Here's basically... another example. See, these yeah. are all the things you could have tried at home, okay? All right. Uh, kernel of phi. Remember, I said if kernel of phi okay, uh -huh. is equal to uh, 1, yeah. right? Yeah. Then phi is 1 to 1, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So let's suppose, let's suppose that phi mm. of g equals 5h, yeah? Does that make sense? And, and, and kernel of phi. Let's assume this. Okay. It's been so long since we defined kernels. <laughs> no, I kind of this lesson. Yeah. Oh, you forgot. Yeah, yeah, this excuses. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really, you know, I can't just go to your house and just make you do stuff. Yeah. My open brain. I mean, the difficulty of this, I guess, will depend on how much you prepare. But obviously, if you didn't prepare much, this could be a good exercise in what you're going to actually do. With writing a proof. Yes, writing a proof. Okay, so if we want to prove this is one to one, right? The conclusion is G equals H, yeah? That yeah. makes sense? Do you have the gain? Do you prove by contradiction? Uh, no, I, did I say that everything was definition chasing? Oh. Definition chasing. So why would the first thing you think of be contradiction? So look, look at this, okay? So this I, guess, this, I guess this is like a, this is the definition of one-to-one, -one, right? Yeah. If this, then that, yeah? yeah? So we have to, we have to verify the definition. Oh yeah, because the, this is literally the definition of any function is one-to-one, -one, the yeah. original definition. So look at this, okay? Let's times both sides by the inverse of 5h, yeah? Uh -huh. By times you mean apply the operation, yeah? Operation. Which exists, yeah. Which is where the second one should be equal to identity, yeah. Yeah, right. So this is phi goes from G to H. And the negative one goes to side of back is the side back. So and we yeah, know exactly. It. Remember we know it preserves inverse. Yes, right? we know it. so it's H minus one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this is yeah. 5G, yeah? yeah. 5G. Um, uh, H minus 1 is 1. And then 5G, and th this is a homomorphism, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. So this goes inside the brackets. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, so uh, what well, that says that, so, G sorry, G the G So GH inverse is in the G kernel. Of. Is in the kernel of 5, yeah? yeah? But the kernel of 5 only has one thing, yeah? Oh, yeah. It's the identity. It's, it's the identity. So GH inverse equals 1G, right? Yeah. Therefore, the H is the H inverse of G. So therefore, G equals H. 
It times both sides by h. You can do that in set theory. It's basically multiplication, except the word is really weirdly. Hmm. Why do you even have set theory? So in a sense, you know, when you put something to axioms and you focus on the pro, like if the proof's very simple because you only have so many things to work with, you're kind of just focusing on the essential things, right? But it's actually a huge achievement to, to get this whole complicated class of objects and then actually say that they're just completely ruled by three axioms, you know? Three axioms that there is an operation. Yeah, there's an operation. There's an operation. There's well, an the identity. operation is taken for granted, but there's identity, yeah. associativity, and inverses. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. When we learn more number theory, I'm going to show you how this apply. This basically proves all the theorems you learn in number theory. The no Olympiad number theory, not just not just like just random university the number theory. Number theory, like it's number theory, like this like how different. Well, I mean, in a sense, when you prove something, you're not really comfortable unless it's done with algebra. Like that's why I guess. Algebra invaded itself into all these other topics, right? Oh, yeah, because people were seeing things, but they weren't comfortable till someone wrote it down in like a very algebraic way. Oh, because way. the first thing we learn is, like, is algebra. So, well, the things that we tend to accept as proofs are, are like it's calculations it's a number and algebra. Theory. Yeah, is a theory. Okay, but, so that was so that, the, and then the last exercise. The point is, we have that. to accept. I have ten minutes to finish this. Yeah, it's a theory. Okay, show that the kernel. Okay, state and prove Kalin's theorem for finite groups. That was the final thing, yeah? You know what it was? So every, guys, this was the theorem. Every finite group, yeah? So this was Kaylee's theorem, yeah? Kaylee's theorem. I don't know if it was actually his theorem. I just, it's called Kaylee's theorem. It is. Every finite group, right, is isomorphic to a subgroup of the symmetric group as n. So Sn is basically identity aim, this is something else. Is it isomorphic? So Sn is the functions that go from n element sets to itself that have inverses, right? Yeah. So does it just mean like every group, the finite group is like can be um, represented as a subset of functions yeah, and, it's one -to -one. and its composition of functions. Yeah. yeah? So, so that another way of thinking of this is that the class of subgroups of Sn or these functions, which are very concrete objects as far as we're concerned, can be axiomatized by groups, by the three axioms of the groups. Okay, you have to really think about that to understand. I'm not going to explain it again. Okay, so every finite group is actually moved to a subgroup of symmetric. Okay. Isomorphic. Isomorphic. So, so basically what that means is there exists a group homomorphism from the group G, right? So there exists phi from G to Sn such that it's one-to-one, -one, okay? Okay. So the, the group... It's also something to do with binary. One to one group homomorphism. So there's there exists a group function that is homomorphic to it that is also one to one. Yeah. Okay. So I guess because because the image the image of the function is isomorphic well if it's one to one, right? Yeah. Then it's isomorphic to the group. Yeah. The group is isomorphic to the range. Yeah? Yeah. And the range is a subgroup of the symmetric group. Yeah. yeah? So we just have to show that there's a group homomorphism that it's one to one. Okay. And we're done, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So if G is finite, right? You can write it as like one, two, three, all the way up to N, yeah? Yeah. If if the size of G is equal to N, yeah? You can define a homomorphism like this. You let um so G element of G. The way you define the homomorphism, you take G to the function G, okay, and the function does this G of I. So this is a function from one, two, three to N, right? To itself, yeah. And what the function does is G of I goes to G times I, yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the point is, this is a function, right? 
So the function takes three to g times three, yeah? G is a function. Yeah. You can't really multiply function. Huh? Oh wait, you can multiply function. Yeah. Could you just repeat it. So basically, you know how there's a function g cross g to g, right? That's the operation, yeah? Well, you can fix the first coordinate to be g, and then this is an operation from g to g, right? Yeah. So that's what this function is. It's, it's g comma blank, yeah? Yeah. Okay. What's up? Oh, um, so it's like each one of these is like each element in g is defined as like a different function that's based on the, like made by itself. Yeah. Okay. So that's the beauty of it. Since there's nothing to work with, right? It has to be something like this. Yeah. You have four things to work with, you know? <laughs> the operation and three axioms. Yeah. It has to be true for all groups, right? So it has to use these things somehow. Okay. Um, so that does that, right? And we have to verify that it's a function. Okay. Yeah. So for example, no, it is a function because we define it like this. We restricted it from that function to, to one of these what, what subsets, is right? G if you restrict blank. a function to the subset, it's still going to be a function. Yeah. What does a blank So so like g, so g comma blank, right? Yeah. Um, can you see that that's a, wait, well, not, that is, so there's a subset of g cross g, right? g cross g gets g? x. The okay. subset of that, you can think of x as, maybe I can call this xg, right? Yeah. xg is the, the set of all things with the first entry g and the other thing like um, I. k, oh yeah, i maybe, yeah? Um, such that i is in g, right? Um, that makes sense. So this is yeah. a subset of that, and you're just restricting the operation to that subset. So that's a function. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this would be like an example of why like, it might not be commuted at all. Mm. Yeah, exactly. OK. Um, yeah, I guess you could have also defined it on the right. Yeah, it oh, could have yeah, been yeah. on the right. So this is a choice. Like, so, is like, so, yeah. of choice. so this is. No, no, no! Don't ask. So, and this is so. This is not like super natural. Like, this is not, not like it's not free of choices, for example. Yeah, but it is reasonably natural. Yeah. Why well, eventually understand all of this? This seems so complex. Exactly. No, no, no! Not only will you eventually understand it, you'll think it's amazing, and you'll think it's easy. Okay, I promise you, okay. with effort. I like what you want to like when you want to harder stuff like everything below it just seems a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Does not understand all of this. Mm. I understand like eighty percent of it, but not all of it. So no, I think it's good that you realize you don't understand all of it, yeah. Yeah. Because that's, that's a, that requires a higher level. I'm a g times g. How does yeah. that equal g? Uh, g like, cross g. So it's two things, two elements from g. G means just it's a standing for any element of the set. Yeah. Any element. It, it takes it. Into, it takes it to another like element. In element of the yeah. set. And I guess I'm identifying this x with a copy of g, right? Because there's as many things in here as there are in G. Why is group sets? Well, eventually we might have learned this to know everything. So yeah, but this is this is the end. This is the conclusion of this. Okay, this is not the start. I mean, it is the start of the theory, but it's the conclusion of this topic. Okay, of our topic. So I'm I'm, I'm selecting things that are within your reach, and I think that will be helpful. Okay, so let's this is very complicated. Um, yeah, I mean, it's more complicated when you don't do the homework. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, so. Did you remember? No, I obviously did not. Started. Yeah, and then you just compete with your natural ability. That's what you're doing right now, right? And some people have better natural ability. And I mean, some people are older too. So, I mean, but like, why put yourself in that situation? All right, so listen, listen, I've got to finish this, okay? Do you have any readings? You can re watch this as well, okay? So it's not like I'm super fast and then like you can't catch up. You can just re watch it. No, because I could have watched like the before watch stuff because after you finish like video, you don't like post. They're all there. They're all there. These are all these excuses. All right. Yeah, and you never talk to me about them, okay? So, all right, look. So, we define something, right? So, it goes from this group element to that function, yeah? Okay. And can you see that... Um. This, so can you see that two different group elements will give you two different functions? Is that obvious? Yeah. 
Yeah. Because you're like in your, because each like element is a different function. Yeah, because because eventually you're going to multiply by the identity, right? Oh, yeah. And so that identity will give you back the group element. So if if they're diff the different elements, they'll have different range value for the identity. Yeah. Because when they input the identity here, they'll get out G, right? Yeah. And if they go to H, you input the identity, you'll get out H, right? Yeah. So if they're the same, so if G is not equal to H, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then G of identity is not equal to H of identity because they're both that equals to G and that equals to H, right? Yeah. And if they are equal, then they are going to be equal on the identity and on everything so else, that's why it's right? That's one-to-one function. So not only is it well-defined, it's one-to-one, -one, okay? By the way, do you know the converse of well-defined is one-to-one? Okay, well, you can think about that later, okay? What's well-defined? A well-defined just means you define a function. So you know how, like, functions, the thing you have to check is it's, it's, it's past the vertical line test? Yeah. Like, one thing only goes to one, not two things? Yes. So that's well-defined, yeah? Yeah. How does this got to do with any Cartesian things? Like, how do you plot this on the Cartesian plane? This is irrelevant, yeah. okay? Vertical line tests. No, yeah, but we're, we're, we're just, I'm trying to appeal to some people's previous understanding of functions, yeah? Because vertical line test was to show that the function was actually a function, yeah. right? It doesn't output two different y values. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yes. So this is what we're showing, okay? If you have a single g, you can't get two different functions here, mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this means it maps to itself. Yeah. Or maps to, uh, yeah. In that order? What do you mean? Like it maps itself in that order. Uh, what do you mean by that? Like, what? Why, like, does each element map to itself? No, 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 like, the function, like, the function takes it back to somewhere in itself. Mm. Actually, then maybe we can use the theorem we showed before. So we have a kernel, right? Yeah. So which of these functions map to the identity function, right? Because oh. the identity function is the identity in SN, yeah? <laughs> So the function that acts to the identity function is the one that g of i equals just i, right? For all i. Yeah? But for, but there's some i that's the identity, right? So g of 1 is going to equal g, right? Yeah. But g of i equals i for all i, so 1 equals g, right? Then what g would i to g? g has to be identity. So the kernel has to be trivial, so it's 1 to 1, yeah? Yeah, so it's equal to g of i is equal to i for all i, right? Yeah, yeah, then, g of one then you let i be 1. Yeah. And then g of, g of one. i is equal to 1, but it also has to equal to 1. It has yeah, to equal to g and it has to equal to one i, right? Yeah. So then 1 equals g. Yeah. Yeah? Okay, so that means it's 1 to 1, right? But, uh, hang on. Why Oh, so because th this is the kernel, right? Something in the kernel. So the g has to take be the identity function. Right, so the identity function does this. Yeah. Um, so g that does this is in the kernel. It's in the kernel because... because the definition of the kernel is the things that map to the identity function. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because uh, the identity function is the identity in this group. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. is the identity function the function that the identity maps to, or is it a, fu a function that does nothing at all? Yes, yeah, so it's a function that does nothing at all. It takes the inputs the same output as the input. Yeah. Well, basically. Oh, so it's a group or it's a group of functions. Yeah, this is a group of functions, yeah? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So the identity function is the identity of that group. And so the kernel is anything from the abstract group that maps to the identity function. Okay. And if it maps to the identity function, it's gonna do this. But because of the way it's defined, um, when you pick i to be the identity, g of the identity will be g times the identity, right? Which will equal to g. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and then, but since it's the identity function, it is also equal to the identity, right? So let me should I write that down. Oh. So g times i equals i for all i, right? Yep. So in particular, g times so, the identity on h. All the functions have to be one. Is equal to one h, right? Oh, yeah. There's a special case of that. But then, g times one h by the definition of the map is equal to g times one h, right? Which is g. Oh. Key audience members disappeared. 
How many people are watching this live stream? None. Lost. I'm pretty sure we talked them all out of it. Yes. With I'm glad you understand it. You actually had a disadvantage that you managed to catch up with that. I don't. I don't understand most of it. Most of it is a definition. But I can see why it's one to one. Because if you have groups of functions that are inverses, then like if uh, if it's not one to one, then the inverse is not a function. So yes, inverse has to be all the same thing. It has to be a function, at the same time. Yeah. So we just restricted them to inverse yes. function, invertible functions. Yeah. Okay. So invertible means one to one, and they all have to have home. They all have to be homomorphic. The group mm -hmm. seems legit. Yes, seems very legit. <laughs> seems legitimately <laughs> legit. Okay, maybe yeah. I, I don't know if I'm any steps, but I think I've shown that it's a one-to-one -one function. Have I shown it's a group homomorphism? So the, I guess there's another more elegant way to show that it's an isomorphism is. I can try to define the inverse, for example. Yeah. Um, wait, do I, what else do I need to show? Have I shown as a group homomorphism? So remember, it was composition of functions, right? Yeah. Yes. If you compose this function with another function, it's actually like that, right? Mm -hmm. But that's just the same as h times g, g here. It's associativity. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Oh, so you can mul you can apply. You can apply operations to functions to make them different functions. The composition, yeah? yeah. We compose functions. So, so H of so G of if you have R. G dot H, right? It goes to the function G dot H, which does G dot H to I, right? Which is equal to G dot H dot I, right? Does that make sense? Just moving the brackets, which you want to see G. Yeah, and so by H. associativity, right? Which is G dot brackets H dot I. Which is G dot brackets H dot I, right? Which is just G dot H, because I is an Which is equal to... I is an identity, yeah. G of H of I, right? Let me scrutinize this. What? Oh. Seems legitimately legit. Seems yeah, so the comp so the operation in the group, right? When so you do what, it, what happened to it the goes operation into the again? composition of functions. So the operation is the function. So what hmm. what how do you define the operation again? Like composition of functions. So you define the operation under SN. You mean SN is composition of functions. Yes, SN yeah, and the group, it just has one. It's abstractly defined. We don't know what it is. We just know that it obeys associativity, yeah? yeah. So G is the group of... Yeah, so in some sense, associativity is modeled under the composition of functions associativity. Mm. Yeah? Because you can always restrict to the invertible functions. G of H so if you had the monoid without the inverses, maybe you can model them under just functions without inverse. Anyway, so let, let's just... Does this make sense? So okay. if you take the operation before you send it through, right? Yeah. You get this function that does this, yeah? What do the brackets mean? They mean nothing. So I guess the brackets just sort of trying to tell you what order you're doing them. So it's... you think of this as one thing being a function, yeah? Oh, it's a G, but, yeah. G times H is a composite function of R, yeah. which is equal to G of H of R. Yeah. Wait a second, this seems oddly familiar. I think this is some here somewhere. Yeah. I think so, this is here somewhere. So this is showing that this is so this is actually I mean what's this here? This this, this here so Yeah, this is phi of G H, right? That's what this is. Yeah. Does that make sense? This is phi of gh, because it's saying that what you send g of h to is this function of i is doing the multiplication, right? What you're showing here with these calculations is you're showing that phi of gh is equal to phi of g composed with phi of h. Yeah, so that's this group homomorphism. I don't even know what the letters represent anymore by this point. 
Like, yeah, but it's almost over, so. They're using Latin, they're using Greek alphabet. Next, I know yeah. they're going to use Chinese. See, the point was, like, Chinese last week we were meant to get to this point, and then this week was meant to be, like, a culmination of understanding and, like, enlightenment. You should use several the from now on. So we checked as a group almost, and we checked it's one-to-one. I need to, like, look at this over, like, whole video over. So why do they make you think that school stuff is so important? Should I send you guys the link to the previous videos? Yes. Or maybe some further readings. Mm. Yeah, I guess you have an excuse because you're in year 8. For some reason, all the year 8s are not conscientious and they can't be focused. <laughs> but that's just an age thing, I think. Um, yeah, I think it's just something like... You you're see? not supposed to... Your brains are not designed to... Uh, supposed to... But their brains are open so Does that make so. sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not <laughs> I don't. I'm joking. I don't know if it's that actually, actually makes sense. sense because one letter represents so many things. X, G, D. So that what happens if you have like G dot every G dot G? Just use the relic of it, please. <sighs> yeah. See, like if G dot I, right? That's is for some reason not equal to G to like B G function. How do you get rid of spiders with your It's scary. I have arachnophobia. Wait, why do you see a spider? Yeah, so this is definitely a well defined yeah, function, nice. okay? Yeah. And it's one to one. Okay, what? it's a group homomorphism. Okay. Chinese. <laughs> I think that's it. I think that's the proof. What do you say? On choir camp. Okay. So a lot of it, like I mean, there's a lot of background work to make these proofs shorter, right? And then if it's not a finite group, can you just imagine that now instead of having a finite set, you could have maybe. By ejections on like a set of size, whatever the size of the group is, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah? And then you can still define them to be functions by left yeah, multiplication. The group is the size is infinite. Yeah, so the size is infinite, you'll be, you'll be yeah. like invertible functions on an infinite set, right? So some of these will be harder. Well, I think the proof is the same. Yeah? Because you define it this way, right? Um, we never really used finite, did we? You know? Yeah, no, not really. We just, we just, we just, we never we even use this N. Yeah. Yeah. You know? uh, uh, okay. Um, Did I not, I, did I, we I, open I, the door for someone? Was there someone opening the door? Someone yes. Yeah. Where is that? Maybe. I get the group of as a sign, just like not completely sure about the run Oh, the one to one. So we said the kernel, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The kernel is the Yeah, there was, that, there was that theorem about the kernel. So all you have to do is verify that anything that goes to the identity is actually the identity. So the kernel's trivial, therefore it's one to one. But then you can even directly verify that it's one to one, yeah? If you want, just to make sure. We did the cuddle with the G of I is equal to like I. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Because so then, yeah. is... then when you put the I as the identity, and then, oh, you put the G of identity is G, right? Is G. But it has to also be I, the so identity. I, G is I is I. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. so the only thing in the cuddle is one. Yeah, sweet. Almost getting it now. What's 